zero. Okay, good. Am I recording what I want? Yes, I am. That's good. Let's switch back to our lab notes right here. So now we are going to download lab number four handout. Lab number four handout is what? Let's take a look at lab number four. It should be the capacitor, right? Lab city. Yeah, we're going to do capacitor. Capacitors and dielectrics. I'm going to cover a little bit of the theory of capacitors so you can understand what is a capacitor. Lecture notes. I'm going to be part of my lecture notes. Okay. Insert page break. You know what? I'm going to put, I'm going to make it part of my lab notes instead. Keep it consistent, right? Has the instructor already covered capacitors? Okay. Here's my email address. Okay. Here you go. What is a capacitor? A capacitor is a very simple device, but it's also important. It's extremely important. I have a bunch of capacitors here in my in my room. Okay. The capacitor. Let's see when it was invented. Let's see when the capacitor was invented. Invention of the capacitor. Okay, 1745, capacitance in electric circuits is deliberately introduced by a device called the capacitor. It was discovered by the Prussian scientist. Prussia was part of, 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 the, of Germany, right? At the Today's part of Germany. You all, George von Kleist in 1745, and independently by the Dutch physicist, Peter Motion broke at the same time while in the process of investigating electrostatic phenomena. Okay, that here is a drawing of a modern capacitor. This capacitor is mass manufactured. This is a mass manufactured device. There are there's just one configuration of a possible capacitor. One possible configuration. There are several other poss possible configurations here. Here is another configuration of a capacitor. Okay? That's another configuration of a capacitor right in here. They would call it Leiden jar at the time. See? Different capacitors that I sold out there in the market. They can be large or small. That is one of those mad scientist type of inventions. People are thinking about creating a capacitor, building a capacitor that's the size of a football field, okay? That, that has been plans to do something like that. So instead of having something that you can hold in your hand, it's going to be buried underground, and this capacitor would be able to produce electricity to a whole facility for 30 days. It's not a battery. Capacitor is not a battery. No, capacitor is a much simpler device, far simpler than a battery. Let me show you some capacitors that I have here. Let's see, let's see. Capacitors, they cost anywhere between like one cent, 
all the way to 10, 20 dollars. I haven't seen capacitors more expensive than that. Okay, here you go. Here's one capacitor that I have. Now look at this, the size of this capacitor, right? Let me see if we can share the whole, just myself, so you can see a better, you can have a better picture. The boot software, uh, if you continue recording, if you continue having, okay, no, that's not what I want. Let me see if I can. Can you, by the way, can, can, it looks like I, I discontinue by, uh, you cannot see me anymore, right? Yeah, you cannot see me anymore. Why is that? What did I do here? Let me pause. Busting so many, oh, you know, with the number, huge amount of screens and software that are, that I'm running simultaneously, okay? So now you you don't see my my screen, the screen that I'm sharing, but you see me. Here you go. Here is a capacitor, one possible capacitor that, that I bought out there. I remember, I suppose that this capacitor cost me $10, okay? But there are more. Here's my little box with capacitors. Like I said, capacitors can have uh, different sizes and shapes. People are thinking about building a capacitor on the size of a football field. And I'm going to show you how. Here, here, more capacitors. Cylindrical. Those are both cylindrical capacitors. And now what I have here is a different type of capacitor. A bunch of them. This one is, I presume that this one is a parallel plate capacitor. I cannot see what's inside, okay? But they have a coating there. You cannot see what's inside. I'm going to show you exactly how you how a capacitor looks supposed to look on the inside. Let's go get it. Here go. Put my capacitors away. What do they do? What capacitors do? They store electrical energy in an electric field. It's a passive electronic component with two terminals. Okay, just like, like a light bulb, a regular light bulb has two terminals. Capacitors also have two terminals. Now let's go ahead and share the screen again, that now that you're familiar with the capacitor. And how they're supposed to look like, how a capacitor is supposed to look like. I'm going to make a drawing. Of possible capacitors. Okay, you saw point charge, you go. Point charge, point charge, electric force. Okay, here you go. And this is an electric field. We're gonna cover electric field in the lecture. Capacitor should come after that. Yeah, nope, not yet. Electric fields of different configurations, okay. Okay, here's a possible capacitor. A capacitor is, what the capacitor is, two conducting metals separated by an electrical insulator, okay? That's the simplest configuration of a capacitor you're going to find out there. In this case, is the parallel plate capacitor. So think about two metallic plates facing one another, each other. That's the simplest, like I said, this is the simplest configuration that I'm going to, going to see out there. And they are both electrically charged. One is charged with a positive charge, the other is charged with a negative charge. Okay? So that's one possible geometrical configuration of a capacitor. Why, why is it important? It's such a simple device, right? How, how such a simple configuration can be so useful? But that's, that's the whole idea.
the whole idea is to the most useful devices are the ones that are the simplest one. So I'm going to don't I'm going to get a illustration of genetic genetic capacitor hanging there. Not this one. It's just something else. Blah 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 blah. blah. Uh, very far. Okay, here you go. I got it. I finally got it. Genetic capacitor. Two pieces of metal. Okay. I can get, here you go. I can get my key and this clipper. They're both metals. Okay. I can make them a capacitor. I can make them a capacitor. If I charge them, one is a positive charge and the other is a negative charge. Okay. Right now they're not charged, but they are still a capacitor. You know, then because they're not charged, they are not a useful capacitor. That's the most generic geometry of a capacitor that I'm showing here to you. I'm going to charge one negatively, another one positively. And they're going to try to attract each other. Okay. Those capacitors are trying to attract, attract each other, but they stay fixed because they are being held by something else that I'm not illustrating. Okay. Right now I have a charged capacitor, a charged capacitor that works more or less like a battery. Works more or less like a battery. Those capacitors that you saw, for instance, this one that I that you saw here, is more like a cylind more most likely the cylindrical capacitor. Let's see if I have illustration here. Here is the parallel plate capacitor, the one that I mentioned initially. Okay. Most likely, this capacitor that you have right in here, that I showed to you earlier, most likely this is a parallel plate capacitor that has been coated with this plastic around it to insulate it. The space between capacitors cannot have a metal in there. You cannot have a metal in the space between capacitors. Because if you put a metal here between the, the, in the space between the capacitor, the capacitor is going to be discharged. The negative charges are going to combine with the positive charges, okay? It's very important that you put a non-conducting element between those two plates of the capacitor, whether, whether it's here, whether it's here. If you end up putting a wire, a conducting wire between those two capacitors, they lose all of its energy. The capacitor is going to lose all of its energy. So remember, those two pieces, those two metallic pieces, they are together a capacitor. A capacitor is made of two elements, two conducting, two pieces of conducting mat of conducting material. Okay. So we go and. Uh, here's a spherical capacitor. Okay, you can have a spherical capacitor, but in order to have a spherical capacitor, one sphere must be concentric to the other one. Okay, that's what this, this illustration is all about. It's a sphere that's concentric to the other, one sphere surrounding the other. And this space here between the spheres are filled with a non-conducting material. Let me put here, it doesn't matter whether the charge, the positive or negative charge, are in the, in the sphere, in the outer sphere or in the inner sphere. It doesn't matter, okay? Here you go. Outer sphere, let's say, is positively charged. Inner sphere is negatively charged. But you can have a different configuration too. Oh, it doesn't matter where the electric charge is located, provided the two surfaces have different signs of electric charge. Here you go. But you have also a cylindrical capacitor. I, I don't have a, a spherical capacitor here. Here you go. Here's my cylindrical capacitor. How is that? You know, how is the cylindrical capacitor? Is it's like, let's say, one tube inside another, or let's say, one cylinder, one solid cylinder inside the cylindrical tube. 
the outer cylinder must be a tube. Otherwise, you cannot insert the other cylinder there, right? This one is definitely a cylindrical capacitor that looks just like that. Okay? And again, the space between those two devices are filled with a material that's not conducting. Okay? Normally, non conducting, no, non conducting materials can be what? Air. Air is one of them. Okay? Air is one type of non conducting material. But there are more paper, wood, plastic, glass. They are all non conducting materials. So let's, let's, let's document all of that. Okay? So here you go. Lecture notes, lab notes. Here you go. First thing you have to know. The first thing you have to know about capacitors before now to know before we get into capacitors is that there are materials or substances that can conduct electricity better than others okay? that you have to do so what do you mean by conduct electricity better than others the following it means that if i put if i have a material i put electric charges here at this point in the material okay if the electric charge diffuses easily throughout the material, moves easily throughout the material, this is a good conductor of electric charges, good electrical conductor, okay? Okay. Materials that allow the electric charge, electric charges to move easily or freely are called electrical conductors. Example of electrical conductors, example. Okay, metals in general, metals in general are very good electrical conductors. Charges move very well. Copper, for instance, that's why we use copper wiring in our houses because they conduct electricity very easily not only conduct electricity very easily easily but coppers are copper is very cheap okay gold gold is a very good conductor too it doesn't conduct electricity as well as copper but it's still a good conductor okay so if you want to optimize electrical conductivity, you are not going to buy gold conductors. You are not going to install gold in the wiring of your house. You're going to install copper because copper has a better conductivity than gold. And on the top of that, gold will be too expensive, right? Silver is a very good conductor. It's better than copper, okay? Silver is a conductor better than copper. Electrons flow, flow more easily, electric charges flow more easily in silver than in a copper. But nobody uses silvers in, this, in the wiring of their house again. Why is that? Because silver is much more expensive than copper. Right? It's not as expensive as gold, but it's still more expensive than copper. Okay? Examples. Metals in general are very good con electrical conductors. Example of metals. Example of metals. Copper, copper, gold, silver, lead, etc. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the conductivity of different metals so you can have an idea which one is better than conductivity. Here you go. Conductivity, electrical conductivity. Let's take a look. Here you go. They must have a table of conductivity. 
Let's take a look. Don't worry about those formulas. Uh, they must have a table. I'm doing that on the fly, okay, folks? Here you go. You get it? Conductivity. See that? Silver has a higher conductivity than copper. See that? The higher the conductivity, the more easily the charges flow in a material. And then gold. Okay, gold has a conductivity, is conductivity that is smaller than copper, almost 20% less, almost 20% less. But look at the conductivity of copper and silver. It's not much different, right? Very small difference. We are talking about uh, 34 parts in 600. 34 parts in 600. It's not much. Three out of 60 we are talking about five percent difference only if you do the math okay so there are others gold aluminum okay calcium they they put the from better from better conductivity to worse conductivity okay tungsten look tungsten here zinc cobalt nickel they all they're all the ones at the top are metals, right? Lead, right in here, and so on. Sea water. See, well, look at the conductivity of sea water. It's not much high compared to metals, right? Much lower. The salt in the water, you know, gives some con electrical conductivity properties to the water. If you want to make water more conductive you d just dump as much salt as you can in the water it's possible to conduct electricity through salt water but sea water has a very small concentration of salt sodium chloride very small concentration of salt that's why the conductivity is so low but if you dump more salt there in the water it becomes more and more conductive okay so that's what you have to know about conductivity if you go Materials that allow the electric charge to move free, easy, move easily or freely are called electrical conductors. Examples: metals in general are very good electrical conductors. Copper, gold, silver, lead, etc. Silver is the metal that has the highest conductivity. And copper, the second highest. However, because of its price, we do not use silver in the wirings of our home. We use copper instead. Okay? So, materials, materials that, materials in which the electric charges become constrained to a given place in the material, i.e., they do not move freely. They do not move freely, easily, or freely. Are called electrical uh, insulators or dielectrics. That's another name for electrical insulators. Electrical insulators insulate electricity. Elec electricity does not move easily from one place to another in an electrical insulator. Interestingly enough, materials that are good electrical insulators, they are also good thermal insulators, okay? Materials that are good electrical insulators are also good thermal insulators. 
because it's all because it all has to do with the motion of electrons. Remember that thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity is dictated by the motion of electrons inside the conductor, right? And they also affect the electrical properties. Okay, examples. Example. Wood. Paper. Here you go. Wood. Paper. What else? Plastic. Glass. Not gas, glass, air. Air is a good electrical dielectric. Vacuum, yeah. Vacuum is a good electrical insulator. We use air. Have you ever heard of double pane windows? Have you ever heard of double pane windows? If you are in the construction business, you should know what, what a double pane in window is. Okay, let me go here. Double pane windows. Here you go. Double pane windows is a window in which you put two glass plates between each other and you keep a gap between the two glass plates. You still can see on the outside. Most windows have just a single glass plate. Most most windows. They are not good at they're not good thermal insulators, okay? And they're not, consequently, they're not good electrical insulators either. You can do better than that, okay? In order to make it, the window a good thermal insulator and a good electrical insulator, you can use two glass plates, not touching each other, but with a gap between them, okay? The gap is filled with a gas, can be air or can be some other type of gas. And because, and just the presence of that gas in the gap makes the window a better insulator. Okay? Here you go, double pane windows, doors and windows. Let's see, let me see if, uh, let me see if we, Wikipedia has a text on that. Maybe they have. Let's see. I like Wikipedia. Insulate glazing. Wikipedia. They call it glazing window insulation. Let's see here. Insulated glazing. Oh, double pane windows. Okay. A window with insulating glass is commonly known as double glazing or a double pane window. Triple glazing or triple pane window, quadruple glazing. <laughs> now you can go infinitely glazing, right? You, you, you can exaggerate you. You can put double pane. You can put triple pane. Pain, you can put, you know, quadruple pain and so on, okay? To increase the number, the gap between the wind, between the glass and increase also the thermal insulating properties, which also would increase the thermal, not the thermal electrical, insulating properties as well, okay? So double hang, okay, so that's a double pane windows. They are good thermal insulators and they're also good electrical insulators. Let's take a look, continue to take a look here at the conductivity. The higher the conductivity of the material, the better, the, the easy, more easily the electrons flow through the material, okay? So the good electrical conductivity is at the top. As you go down, the conductivity decreases, see that? And then we go to Teflon. Have you heard of Teflon? Look at the electrical conductivity of Teflon. Orders of magnitude less. Teflon is a very interesting material. It was discovered by chance. Teflon was discovered by chance by a 3M scientist. Okay, but Teflon, remember, Teflon is, is a commercial name. The actual scientific name is PTFE polytetrafluorotylene, okay? The flon is a trademark name. Oh, it's Deep Dupont, not 3M. Sorry, folks. Spin-off from Dupont. Yeah, 3M is a good company too, but it was Dupont, that uh, Dupont scientist who discovered the compound in 1938. By accident, by the way. 
So it has a very good insulating property, electrical insulating property, and most likely a very good thermal insulating property. And there is another application of teflon too. You folks should know what the, a good application of teflon. Teflon, that uh, we coat some pans with at the bottom of the pan with teflon. So if you are going to a frying pan, for instance, a frying pan, pan. If you want to fry an egg, the egg doesn't stick there. You don't need to put oil in there. The flow itself is, does the job for you. PET, PET is a type of uh, plastic, okay? Polyethylene. Polyethylene is just the, the type of plastic that our bottles are made of. What else? Fused quartz is a good electrical insulator. Sulfur, wood. Remember I told you wood? Air is a good electrical insulator. But it seems, yeah, wood seems to be better than air as an insulator. It's a range, right? It all depends on the wood. And here is all the, depends on the on the density of the air. Let me see if they have vacuum here. I don't see vacuum. Yeah, they didn't put vacuum must have a zero thermal electrical insulating. Electrical conductivity, hard rubber, carbon, diamond, glass. Remember, glass, I told you, is a very good electrical insulator, not as good as teflon. Dump wood. So, if you put water in the wood, the wood becomes a better conductor. Deionized water, di water, silicon, drinking water. Okay, drinking water has a little bit of minerals in there. The minerals add to the conductivity of the water the ionized water has a lower conductivity swimming pool water because it has all sorts of ions there chloride ions for instance sea water but the flow remember the flow those are dielectric materials or electrical insulators let me put the flow there in my list i like the flow Lab notes, da, da, da. Uh -huh. plastic vacuum, Teflon, okay, which is a type of plastic. So if you're building a capacitor, you're going to use a metal, in general use a metal, filled, separate two metals, two charged metals, separated by a dielectric or an electric insulator that's how simple it is and that's what this guy is made of okay that this guy is made of there is a macroscopic capacitor out there that i sold for classroom okay let me get a capacitor parallel plate capacitor demonstrator here you go capacitor demonstrator Maybe it's, uh, let me see, capacitor for the classroom. The classroom. I like a capacitor that we have. Let me see. Not the, oh, here you go. That's the one I like. I want to show you. They sell this one out there. They sell. You know, it's a big device. Okay. It's for educational purposes. See the, pla the thermal, the metal plate here? I believe it's aluminum plate. Okay, this aluminum plate is more is mounted in a support that's a plastic support, that's a dielectric support. So it's insu electrically insulated from the surrounding. Two plates, two parallel plates. That's what this capacitor is all about. It's two parallel plates, but the size of that one in the screen that you see here is, 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 is bigger, it's larger. They sell this capacitor for $67 and you can adjust the distance between the plates of the capacitor. 12 centimeters circular metal discs. Insulated support. See that? Adjust distance between discs. Read distance by noting respective position. Okay? That's what they sell. The Fisher Scientific. I once did some experiments with a capacitor here at Loyola Marymount University, LMU. I used to teach there. It was a really nice experiment. Just the only university that I was able to do 
a capacitor experiment like this one. They have a bunch of those capacitors. Every call, every other college that I teach, CSU, Santa Monica College, LA Harbor College, they don't have that. At LA Harbor College, we have only one. CSU, we have only one. But the one that we have at CSU is a shame. You know, people mistreated the capacitor. It looks so ugly. You know, they didn't take care of it. But then at Loyola Marymount University, they have a bunch of capacitors like that. They all, all look nice. They have a very nice experiment for those capacitors. So now that you know how a capacitor looks like, right? What time is that? 1.20? Any questions so far? Let me check. Let me close this one. Let me check here. Yeah, no questions so far. Let's go a little bit longer. 10 more minutes to go before we go for our break. Okay, so here we go. Don't forget this material that I'm covering is also applicable to the lecture. So if you have to review the material for the lecture, I will post the video there in my YouTube channel. I'll say that it was the first electrical electronic device to be invented. Let's go back to Wikipedia for the capacitor, right? Capacitor. Wikipedia. There you go. Now you know what is the configuration of the capacitor. Uh, now, and I also went to document here. It is made, it is made of three components. Two conductors separated by an insulator. Two electrical conductors separated by an electrical insulator. When the conductors are charged, the capacitor store energy. An uncharged capacitor, uncharged capacitor has no electrical energy whatsoever. Okay. Just like a battery, a battery has electrical energy, and so that's like a, a charged capacitor. The capacitor must be charged to have energy. And once you have something that have energy, if you are smart enough, you can use that something to do a useful task, right? That's what energy is all about. We use energy to do to, to do a useful task, but you gotta be careful not to waste that energy. Otherwise, you know, you lose all that energy and you gotta recover that energy some, some other way, right? There are four basic devices in electronics, only four, there are not 300. In electric, electricity and electronics. The capacitor is the first of them, it's the first one that was invented. Okay. So you know, history, here you go. Let's go to history, 1745, whatever. They would call that at the time, they would call it the Leiden jar. Why is that? Because the Dutch physicist used to work at the University of Leiden. Okay, the guy that invented it or discovered that. Benjamin Franklin also uh, worked, investigated the Leiden jar. That guy was not just a, a politician, but he was also a an inventor and scientist. Okay, it's, well, it's amazing that this guy was able to do all that stuff. He was just like a Leonardo da Vinci, an American Leonardo da Vinci. Look, an active writer, scientist, inventor, statesman, diplomat, printer. He was even, you know, he even worked with, must have had a press publisher and political philosopher. We have a Brazilian, you know, counterpart for Benjamin Franklin, okay, but he lived, uh, 
He lived in the 18th century. Benjamin Franklin lived in the 1700s, right? This Brazilian Benjamin Franklin, he lived in the 1800s. He, also, also, he was also one of the founding fathers of Brazil. And his name was Bonifacio de Andrade Silva. Bonifacio. He had the uh, Andrade Silva. José Bonifácio de Andrade Silva. You know, th this guy makes me remind Benjamin Franklin. You know? Okay, that's his. That's the Brazilian. That's one of the Brazilian founding fathers. Oh, see, he was a naturalist as well. Kind of a scientist. Miner mineralist. Mineralogist, I guess. Professor and poet. He was born in this city. It's a, it's a coastal city there in Brazil, in Santos. 1763, he was born in 1763. Let's take a look at Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was born, he, he died in 1838, right? I, be, I believe Benjamin Franklin was older than him. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, oh, let's do that again. 1705, yeah, was much older. Benjamin Franklin was much older than, than José Bonifacio. Okay, so 126, what else do we have to cover here? Capacitor, so let's, let's see if we have something else more interesting about capacitors here. Capacitors. History, okay. Island jars are more powerful devices imply, implying flat glass, flat, flat glass plate alternating with foil conductors. See that? Flat, uh, flat glass plates is the insulator. And then you can put foil conductors, just like your aluminum, aluminum, aluminum sheets, right, that we buy there at the supermarket. Early capacitors were known as condensers. That's another name for a capacitor at that time. Early capacitors. A term that's occasionally used today. Since the beginning of study of electricity, non-conductive materials like glass, porcelain, paper, and mica have been used as insulators. Have you heard of mica? Have you heard of mica? They look just like that. They are small flakes that look like glass. Okay? When I was growing up there in Brazil, I used to collect stones, so I used to pick up stones along the way and I would look look at the stone, how it looked like, I was a little kid, and every now and then, many stones, they have those little flakes, you know, on the surface of the stone, and they look just like that, little, you know, flakes, which by the way, I, I, they were used at the time, maybe they are still used today. They are using irons, okay? Big mica plates, you go. Paper capacitors made by sandwiching strip of impregnated paper between strips of metal. See that? Paper is a di dielectric as well. Okay, here's the theory of operation. Okay, here you go. The capacitor that I mentioned to you, very similar to the other one that... Uh, that you saw previously. You can adjust the separation of the plates to create different types of capacitor just by changing the distance between the plates. You come up with a different capacitor. Okay, so conductive plate, here you go. Conductive, it's a sandwich. It's a dielectric, it's a sandwich of a dielectric. Okay? You sandwich the dielectric between two metals, two conductor plates, and then you charge the conductor. That, that is simple of all capacitors out there. And then we have all the theory, mathematical theory that comes with it. We use capacitors in a circuit. That's the, that's how we represent capacitors in a, a schematic, in a circuit a schematic, two parallel plates, right? Two lines. and so on. We use capacitors in our radio, you use capacitors in the keyboard. This keyboard that you have here has a bunch of capacitors in there. There are all sorts of applications for capacitors, it's not just store energy. Capacitors do other things as well. 
capacitors do other things as well. Okay, you can be used for other things as well. Whatever the application of a capacitor is, the applications are only bound by your imagination and knowledge, of course, right? Imagination combined with knowledge, you can come up with different devices. And people, every now and then, they figure out ways to use capacitors in different applications for, for different devices, okay? Let's take a look here at the Today is the 21. Bella, I'm asking, are you there, Bella? I'm here. I can hardly hear you, Bella. Oh, I'm here. Let me see. Maybe it's my sound that's uh, too low. Okay, I hear you. Bella is there. Annabella, are you there? Here. Okay. Sarah Cabrera? Here. Good. Carly Dye? Here. Mahedi? Here. Okay, Wesley Motley. Wesley didn't come. Let me take a look here at the Wesley, Wesley, Wesley. Oh, I see Wesley here. No answer. If you're hearing me, Wesley, I'm not hearing you. Oh, oh yeah, I'm here. Okay. Ada. Here. Okay, Jordan. Here. Okay. Yeah. Professor? So low. Everybody's coming low here. I don't know. I wonder if it's my. Let me see if it's the. My computer. Uh, here. Oh, yeah. That's right. It's here. The problem is here. It's not my. Next, Donica. Are you there, Donica? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm coming low again. Uh, Shagar, Nurali? Here. Yeah, let me see what's going on. Say again, Sh Shagar. Yeah. Wanna... Oh, okay, better now. It's just my volume here, my speaker was too low. Daniela Rodas. Here. Okay, Dior. Here. Okay, Shreya. Here. Okay, Peter Gerks. I can see Peter here. Okay. Uh, oh, here. Sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Here. Okay, Anna Ponce. Here. here. Kaylee. I'm here. here. Alisa. Here. here. Jasmine. Here. here. Okay, 18. Here you go. Give your attendance. Professor? Professor? Yeah? You, you put, put that I, I didn't attend last class, and I, I did. Is that Ada? Yes. yes. OK, I'm, I'm sending a chat message right now. OK. OK, 18, 133 right now. So let's schedule it here. Break on 35 to 150, okay? I'll see you in 15 minutes.
I'm back here. Okay, so so keep okay, so keep that in mind in electricity there are four different devices, only four. And with all those four devices, we can build whatever you want. Your cell phone is a combination of those four devices, your TV, your computer monitor, your, your computer screen, right? It, the first one is the capacitor that we're going to study today, that you already know what the configuration is. The next one is the resistor. I have a bunch of resistors here as well. There, all those devices, you know, there's, they are all mass manufactured. So capacitor, resistor, inductor. Inductor is used in magnetism, and then the latest one is the transistor. Let's see, let's see when the transistor was invented. It says here 1947. It is it's a 20th century invention. Transistor. Whoever invented the, invented the transistor managed to win the Nobel Prize. Okay, a transistor is a semiconductor device used to amplify or switch electronic signal in electrical power. In electrical power. So this transistor can be used to amplify or switch electronic signals and electrical power. Okay. He go Austro-Hungarian physicist proposed the concept of a field effect transistor. We call it FET, F-E-T, FET, in 19, 19, 1926. He proposed, he didn't invent it, but it was not possible to actually construct a working device at the time because the technology was not there yet. It's a very, you know, it's a huge frustration when you are a scientist, you, pro you propose something, but you cannot demonstrate, you propose theoretically, but you cannot demonstrate in practice because the technology didn't get there yet. Okay? Back in that, when I was working at NASA, back in the 1990s, you know, I came up with an idea of an optical fiber sensor. And later on, I discovered, later on, you know, not later on, at the time, my boss came to me, you know, I was very frustrated about the experiment I was doing with my optical fiber sensor. I couldn't get it right. And then, you know, at that time, my boss came to me, my another boss came to me, now, if you, if you didn't get that stuff yet, that's because the technology didn't get there yet. That's what he told me at the time. Okay. So, Claude, you don't feel frustrated about that because, you know, apparently what's happening here, you cannot achieve your experiments because the technology didn't get, we still don't have the technology to do what we want to do. At the time, we want to, to have a distributed optical fiber sensor. 30 years later, I discovered that my boss was wrong. We did have the technology to do what we were proposing to do. I just didn't have the knowledge that was necessary to come up with that technology. We had a different mindset. There is a difference between mindset, right? And lack of technology. Sometimes there is no technology for you to do what needs to be done. And sometimes you do have the technology to do what needs to be done, but you do not have the right mindset. You're thinking in the improper way. Okay, that's why we have this expression, you gotta think outside the box. Okay, we were thinking inside the box when I was working there at NASA. So keep that in mind for the future, okay? So here you go, what happens to the, to the transistor? The first working device to be, to be built was a point contact transistor, which was invented in 1947. So 20 years, okay? Since the first proposed concept, to the first invention, 21 years. And the guy that invented the transistor was American, uh, American physicist, John Bardeen and Walter Bratton, working under William Shockley at Bell Labs. That was the guy who got the Nobel Prize. Let me see if the other two also got. Maybe they shared an, oh yeah, he shared a Nobel Prize with his boss. That was the boss, you know, those two guys were working under William Shockley. They share the Nobel Prize. Let me see here. What an American engineer. He's the only person to be awarded the Nobel Prize twice. Wow, this guy got the Nobel Prize twice. Huh, you know that. First 1956 with William Shockley. 
for the invasion of the transistor in 1972 for the fundamental theory of what? Let's see, let's see. Uh, again, uh, fundamental superconductivity. Oh, this guy worked in superconductivity in 1972. Not bad, huh? The only person to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics twice. Yeah? And the first person to be awarded two Nobel Prizes. The first, first person to be awarded the two Nobel Prizes, not necessarily in physics, not necessarily both in physics, was Marie Curie, a woman. Okay? She won a Nobel Prize in chemistry and she won a Nobel Prize in physics. So she won the Nobel, those two Nobel Prizes before this guy. But she didn't win two Nobel Prizes in physics. Okay? This guy was the first one to win two Nobel Prizes in physics. In, okay, so th that's how important the transistor is. You know, the people awarded the Nobel Prize for the for the invention of the transistor. The three shared 1956 Nobel Prize in physics. The most widely used type of transistor is made up by MOSFET. I don't want to do that, which was invented. Okay, this guy, those two guys invented. Oh, do you see Bell Labs here? All over the place, right? Bell Labs, Bell Labs. Bell Labs doesn't exist anymore. You know, the government closed down Bell Labs. Back in the 90s, the government closed down Bell Labs. We would call that Mabel. Unfortunately, you know, I had my boss, my later boss, my, you know, he, he, he lives here in California. He, he lives here in Los Angeles. He used to work for Bell Labs. I used to visit him there in Bell Labs. Transistor revolutionized the field of electronics and paved the way for smaller and cheaper radios, calculators, and computers, among other things. Okay? So, four important devices that you have to keep in mind. The one that we're studying right now is the capacitor. Later on, we're going to talk about the resistor. Uh, and we're not going to have time to talk about the inductor. We're not going to have time to talk about the transistor. The transistor is more for a more advanced course in electronics. This one we still cover in physics 122, okay? But let's concentrate on the capacitor right now. Okay, so as a capacitor, basically it's two pieces of metal or electrical conducting material that's put next to another one. Next to another one. Ne one piece of metal put next to another one. And these two pieces must be separated by a dielectric material. Simple capacitor you see is the parallel plate capacitor represented by two lines parallel to each other. Okay, here we go. A capacitor is a device to hold electric charges. You can charge one plate positively, the other plate negatively. If you manage to keep those two plates charged, you have some electrical energy that you can use to do some useful task. Okay, you can have a charged or uncharged capacitor. An uncharged capacitor just like an uncharged battery. You cannot do anything with it. Okay, the capacitor, you can use it over and over again. Batteries, depending on the battery, right? Some batteries, you can recharge them. Most batteries out there, you use them and throw them away. Okay, there are rechargeable batteries that you can use, that you can recharge them a hundred times. I have, I still have some of those here. I buy them, keep it here, you know, whenever I use them, whenever, whenever I want. Whenever they become discharged, I recharge them again and so on, right? The ability of a capacitor to hold charges can be quantified by a parameter that we call the capacitance C. And the definition of the capacitance is right in here, is the amount of electric charge per voltage difference. So we're going to cover what voltage is, okay? So don't worry about that yet. We can quantify, and what you have to know is the unit of a capacitance. The unit of capacitance is the Faraday. That's how we quantify capacitance. That's how we measure the capacitance. This is in units of Farad. We measured the amount of electric charge in coulombs. We measured the voltage in volts. And by the way, volts is just a different way of measuring energy. And in the case of a capacitance, which is the capacity, ability of a capacitor to hold charges, we measure it in Faraday. The higher the capacitance, the higher the amount of charge that a capacitor can carry. OK. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and let's start our lab. Let's go to our Uh, let's go to illustration la he goes yes you I'm not I'm not am I am I sharing the screen yes I'm sharing the screen good very good shape here let's go do, 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 spring summer summer to lab handouts let's go to our have lab handouts Capacitor and dialectic experiment. Okay, so here you go. I'm just doing here for you, right? Cover page. You put uh, the format that needs to be put according to the lab syllabus. Virtual capacitor and ex dialectic experiment. So let's go to the page here, the link. Click this link. Okay, run the simulation. We're chart. We're loading the page. Okay, that's what you're supposed to see there. See, we have a battery here connected to two plates. Just like I have here, here you go, my capacitor. I want to charge my capacitor. I connect, you know, this capacitor to my battery. Let's get, let me charge my capacitor. Here's my battery. I want to charge my capacitor. One way to charge a capacitor is by connecting to a battery. That's one way. There are simpler ways of charging a capacitor, okay? But this one is the most practical one. Battery is already charged. Let me see one thing here. Yeah. Okay, some capacitors, they have a polarity, okay? Not all capacitors have a polarity, but some of them have. Let me show you this one here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen momentarily. You saw this capacitor before. Take a look here at this capacitor. See, we have a shorter lead than the other, okay? What does it mean? The shorter wire means that this terminal here of the capacitor is negative and this other terminal is positive. But like I said, most capacitors do not have a polarity, but this one has. And it is emphasized by the fact that we have a negative sign here in this capacitor. If I want to charge this capacitor, I have to connect this lead to the negative of my battery and the other one to the positive. Right now, I have this capacitor has been charged to 9 volts, close to 9 volts, okay? So right now, this capacitor has some energy, electrical energy, on, on its plates. If I connect this terminal to the other one, I'm going to discharge the capacitor. See that? Right now, there is no electrical energy in the capacitor anymore. Professor, yeah. we can see the screen. You cannot see what? <clears throat> we can't see the screen. No, 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 I'm not showing the screen. I'm showing the capacitor first, okay? Do you see the capacitor? I'm holding here the capacitor. Do you see that? I can't see that either. Really? What's yeah. going on here? Oh, that's because I didn't start my video. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very much, yeah. Go on. Let me see. Oh, no, my video is not restarting. Oh, I hate that. See that, I start to have this problem. When I turn off the video, I cannot turn back my video, and I know the reason. There is a conflict between Zoom and my screen capture software. That's the reason. Let me see. Let me see if I can get. Uh, let me see if I can fix that. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop recording the session with my screen capture software. Okay.